What's up? It's Phil from Fit World Exposed. Today I have a very special guest, John Hansen. He's the three times National Universe winner and the first Natural Olympia winner. So very honored to have him on the channel. I actually discovered him from Nick Strength and Power and i um, just very happy to have him on the channel overall. So how are you doing today, John? Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, man. So the theme of today's episode is going to be drug-free lifting. We're going to get into arm training. Then we'll throw in a few nutrition questions at the end. So first things first, um, let's talk about natural lifting, right? Okay. So what's your thoughts on natural lifting versus enhanced, just generally speaking? Well, I'll tell you, when I got into bodybuilding, um, one of the first articles I read was an interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And they started talking about steroids, and Arnold said that he did use steroids for competition, and he only used them uh, 12 weeks before a competition, you know, the last few months as a uh, finishing touch, he called it. But one of the things he said in that article was he said that steroid gains are only temporary, and that you should always build your body, especially if you're a young man. And I think I was 15 years old when I read that article. He said you should build your body naturally, so it's your body. You know, you should build the muscle with the training, with the nutrition, and that way you'll always have your physique. And that always stuck with me, and I think that's why I went into natural bodybuilding and, and decided to do that because I always remembered that, and I never wanted to have a body that was based on just drug usage. You know, I wanted to do this. You know, I'm in my 50s now, and I've been doing this my whole life. I'm going to continue to do it my whole life. This is a lifestyle for me. I always wanted to have a good muscular physique. And I didn't want it to just be a temporary thing that was a result of drug usage. I wanted to do it where it was my physique and I built it up with my hard work. So that was my initial philosophy with natural bodybuilding and I've stuck with that. And I think that's what teenagers should remember is that steroid use is just temporary. You know, I mean, steroid gains are just temporary. So anything you build with steroids is just gonna, you really have to develop your body. And it takes not only time, but it also takes a lot of hard work. And I think that's what a lot of people in the gym, I look around the gym when I see uh, young guys training today, and a lot of them just get their information off of YouTube or whatever, and they're not really training hard. It takes a lot of years of really, really hard training with heavy weights and really pushing yourself to force the muscle to grow. And in combination with that, you need a good nutrition program because I know when I was younger, I was very uh, skinny and I had a very fast metabolism. So in order for me to grow, I had to really eat a lot of food, way more than normal. I had to eat a lot of complex carbohydrates, a lot of protein. I almost had to force the food in in order to get bigger. But that's what you need to do in order to change your body. A lot of people aren't genetic freaks. They don't grow very easily. So it takes a lot of hard work with not only the training but also the nutrition and also learning how to recuperate and all that. And uh, it's just really a matter of hard work and training, and it takes years of time to get there. And it, there are no shortcuts. You have to believe that. You know, a lot of people think that the secret is steroids and that, you know, the big guys are hiding the secret from us. But there really is no secret. It's just it's a lot of hard work. Do you consider yourself uh, to be a guy who had good genetics? Like, like what were your strong points and, um, and weak points when you first started off when, like 40 years ago? Yeah, that's that's a good question because when I started, like I said, I was 135 pounds and I would look at the magazines and I would look at guys like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lou Ferrigno, Robbie Robinson, and I'd be like, man, they look like they're from a different planet than me. They didn't look like the same guy. You know, I didn't look like, how am I ever going to look like that, you know? So after one year of training, I think I was like 150 pounds after the first year and I had my brother take some pictures of me posing. And when I looked at the pictures, I could see that I had a good structure. I had wide shoulders, I had a big rib cage, my biceps had a peak on them, my lats were attached real low, my chest was attached like real low and wide. Mm. So I could see I had the muscle shape and the structure, I just didn't have the size. So I, I had what I thought was long-term potential. You know, I didn't have uh, potential where I would grow very easily. I wasn't like a, a genetic freak like that. But I could see that down the line, if I worked hard enough and I built enough size, eventually I could have a, a, a winning bodybuilding physique. So I think that's what you have to look at. It's not just how fast you grow, but it's also your bone structure, the shape of the muscles, and those things you really can't, you really can't change. So in a way, I had good genetics, but it took me a long time to realize that genetics. I wasn't that great as a teenager, 
I always did well. I competed in 10 teenage contests, so I competed a lot as a teenager. Mm. I never won mm. a teenage show. Uh, back then in the 1980s, the teenage shows were very, very competitive. Um, but I never won an overall teenage show, but I always did well. But it wasn't until I was in my 20s when I really started to build that muscle mass. I got up to 230 pounds by the time I was 21. So I had increased my body weight almost 100 pounds, all natural. And I think that's then I was able to realize my genetics. And I could look at my body then and look at pictures of myself and say, wow, that's, that's the body I could imagine building years ago. And now it's actually coming to fruition. That's crazy, especially when you when you talk about the um, the wide structure with like the rib cage and like you know the lats. And the yeah. Bicep. But yeah. What, you, what were you, what do you think were your your weak points? Like, did you have good like low triceps, calves, and like? Uh, um, uh, my weak stuff? points were my my legs for sure. I have uh, I'm only five foot eight, but I have long legs and a sort of a shorter torso. So I had big I had a big back right off the bat. My, I remember the first teenage show I did when I was 16, I had the best rear lat spread on stage because I had really good lats. But my legs were kind of long and thin, and uh, the way the muscles are attached on my legs are sort of narrow. So I have sort of legs like Arnold, you know, like when they're in good shape and they're real cut, they look good, but they're not big quads like uh, Jake Cutler or uh, Tom Platts or something like that. So I had to build my legs. My legs were my biggest challenge. My triceps weren't as good as my biceps. Uh, my shoulders in the beginning were very flat. They didn't have a cap on them. So I really had to learn how to train that side deltoid in order to get bigger uh, delts. And even my chest was real flat in the beginning. And then as I grew, it, it got more size. And because of the shape of my chest, it became a real strong point for me. But it took years and years of training in order to develop that mass before it looked really good. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so... So back onto the topic of like drugs and stuff, right? So okay, um, <clears throat> I was actually doing a Q and A with Lee Hayward. Was well, like a huge following, you know. He has like quarter million subscribers. Wow! But um, he was like more old school, you know. He's like he started in two thousand six, you know. So okay. his channel like is doing well, but it's not as like as popular. Like he's not getting as many views as like a lot of the newer YouTubers. And the reason okay. why is because he's kind of from kind of like a different era. So now. There's a lot more teens and a lot more of like the newer generation, per se, who's like wa viewing a lot of YouTube videos, you know. For the yeah. most part, it's a lot of like the younger crowd. Now, what I'm noticing okay. with, with the younger crowd is that these people had a very like influential period in their life where, you know, they're, they're like imagine, you know, you're, you're 15 or 16 year old ma male and you're, like uh, you see a, you see like these bodybuilders online and like, they, like you said, it looks like they're from a different planet, you know. Right, right. And, um. I'm a trainer online and like I work at a gym and stuff and what I'm starting to notice is that in just like regular commercial gyms like we're not we're not talking gyms where uh, these people are trying to become elite athletes and they're really trying to push it to the limit with like high high class coaches and stuff we're talking like like planet fitness type gyms like econo fitness type gyms just yeah. your average Joe at like ten ten dollar gyms a month whatever and what I'm noticing right. is that I observe everything and I'm noticing that a lot of these teenagers are hopping on cycles like very fast right yeah. and i know that like they're not going to really listen to me even though like i have like a big following and stuff like they're gonna do what they want you know but every now yeah. and then i try to tell them like look i understand like the goal you're trying to achieve like because they're telling me like i want i want this body you know yeah and i'm telling them like look like you could get that body drug free yeah you just have to put in the work you know it's like uh right enough for like this instant gratification stuff like you could actually get it you just like, God forbid you have to go to the gym four days a week to and put in a little <laughs> right. bit of work and eat well and, you know, and do that for right. a few years to get the body. But it, people want it right now. They want it this second. And I'm trying to tell them, like, you may not even need drugs to get that body. You know, you could probably get it drug free, but right. you want to rush it and you want to, like, get on these crazy cycles to get it faster. Whereas if you yeah. reach your genetic ceiling, you'll, you'll probably get it. Worst, worst case, if you really want to go that route. You'll need like a tiny bit of stuff, so just a little bit, yeah. And you'll get the body, yeah. you know. So yeah, I know I'm ranting a bit here, but what's your piece of advice for these teenagers? Like, what's the like? Because you know they're naive, you know they a lot of them are ignorant, they're stubborn, yeah. And for the most part, they're not gonna listen. But like, someone of like a higher level and like a bit more respect, a lot more respect in the fitness industry, yeah. How would you go about approaching this? Well, I'll tell you when I. 
Well, I told you when I read that article about Arnold, and he was saying that the only guys, one of the things he said was the only guys who took steroids were the elite bodybuilders in the Mr. America, Mr. Universe, you know. So I started competing as a teenager when I was 16 years old. And the first teenage show I did, I think I got fifth place. The guys who beat me were all 19, and they were way bigger than I was. Like, the, they were, a couple of them were really big. So I said, well, I never thought it was steroids. I thought, you know, they're just bigger than me because they train longer than me. They're, they're, they're 19. They're three years older than me. I'm only 16. So I started competing in teenage shows. I was doing shows like every three months, every four months. I was doing like three, four shows a year. I competed in 10 teenage shows in three years. So after a while, I started to realize that the teenagers were also using steroids, the guys I was competing against, because I would see guys making unbelievable gains in like three months. And at first I thought it was me. I was like, man, I got to train harder. I got to eat better. You know, I thought I wasn't training hard enough. And then my training partner, I was like 17, 18 years old. My training partner was 21. He was an older guy. And uh, he was using steroids just recreationally for himself. So he told me, he goes, John, it kills me to watch you go in these shows. And he goes, I know you put your heart and soul into it. And he goes, you're natural. And he goes, these guys you're competing against aren't drug free. He goes, you could beat these guys if you went on a cycle. So he goes, I can get you the stuff if you want. He goes, you know, because it was easy to get back then. This was in the 1980s. Drugs were really actually legal. You could go to a doctor and get them. So he goes, I'll get the stuff for you. And I'm like, no, man, I don't want to do it. I said, I don't want to take, because I was 180 pounds, I think. I said, what am I going to be if I take drugs? 200? I mean, that's ridiculous. Why not push my body as far as I can go and get as big as I can naturally? Why would I take drugs as, as a teenager? So I stayed drug free as a teenager the whole time on all the 10 shows I did. I never won an overall teenage show. And then when I got out, when I stopped competing as a teenager, because my metabolism was so fast, um, once I gave my body a break and I stopped dieting, I went from, I think I was 175 pounds in my last teenage show to 205 in like six months. My body just grew real fast because I finally gave it a break from all that dieting and everything. And my metabolism just responded by growing, you know, getting bigger. And everybody in the gym was like, wow, you look great, man. You look, you know, you're over 200 pounds. This is the biggest I've ever seen you. And then you talk about the ceiling, you reach the ceiling. When I got to 205, I could not gain any more size. I was stuck. I mean, for eight months, I was stuck. I couldn't gain a pound. I was eating a lot of food. I was training only four days a week. I was training with heavy weights, basic exercise. I was doing everything right. I just couldn't gain any weight. So again, guys from the gym were like, John, you stayed natural your whole teenage career. Why don't you do the drugs now? Why don't you do, you know, you're not, you're not a teenager, teenager anymore. So just do them now. And I said, no, man, no, I can get bigger. I can do it. So I stayed natural and I just figured out my diet. I wrote everything down. I figured out exactly how many calories I was taking in, how many carbs. And I like increased it dramatically. I said, I'm going to force my body to gain weight. I'm going to cut you off real quick. When you said the 205 yeah. was like the, you couldn't pass it for eight months. Right. Are, are you talking like you couldn't pass 205 like without gaining fat or you're just like quality weight? I just couldn't gain weight at all. So my metabolism was so fast. I was like 20 years old and I was eating so much food and I just couldn't even gain a pound. And do you know what the body fat was around? Like weighing 205 at eight at um, five foot eight, like... Around what, what was it like 15 well, percent? Well, my body fat was, I'm not sure. I didn't do my body fat percentage, but I wasn't ripped, but I wasn't real fat, you know. It's like 14 something, 14 percent or something. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I would say over 10 percent, but probably not 20 percent, you know. Yeah, so when I, when I figured out my diet, I just like uh, just dramatically increased my food and I got up to 230 pounds in like six months. I went from 205 to 230. Now, at 230, I was I wasn't uh. I wasn't lean. I was bulky. Of course. But I had accomplished my goal of, of increasing my body weight, and I totally changed my body by doing that. I, Because my metabolism was so fast and I was so young, I finally gained that weight. And after that, after I got to that 230 bulky, I dieted down for a next my next contest. After that contest was over, I was able to just right away get back to 230 easily. It was like I didn't have to go through all that bulking up and eating all that food and force feeding myself because I had changed my metabolism by getting up to 230 and then once I had done that I sort of broke the ceiling you know so to speak 
and I broke the barrier, and then it was much easier for me to always stay big and be bulked up all the time in the off season. It's funny, it's funny you said because I have the exact same story. Obviously, I had a higher body fat, you know, but yeah, I I, I was always stuck at two hundred eight, no matter what, yeah. you know. And yeah. And um, I remember I had like a got like a knee surgery, ACL, and then like I had to take time off training a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when I jumped back into training, and when I, when I started by eating properly again, yeah, for some reason it was easier to get to to two thirty. Yeah, and like which yeah, is my goal exactly. at two thirty, but like, but what I've noticed is that I think it's, I think it's really hard to get there. It but is once you're there, it's like somewhat easier to maintain it, you know. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's so weird. I can understand these kids who are skinny and have fast metabolisms, and they think the only way to get there is through drugs, and you know, the drugs will put on size, but you can do it naturally. You just have to really push yourself. And I think one of the things that's missing from when I look at the gym, around the gym, and I see other people training, is it's really a lot of hard work. And I'm talking years of hard work. You know, this doesn't come easy. As you said, you know, you got to put in the years and you got to put in the time. Um, when we were training at the gyms I trained at back in the 1980s, they were different than they are today. They didn't have those big gyms that they have today, you know, like these uh, lifetime fitnesses and stuff. Or... Um, uh, LA Fitness or things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. We just had the small independent gyms that were owned by one guy and it was real hardcore and everybody in there was like power lifters and bodybuilders and there was no air conditioning and everybody trained heavy and everybody used the basic exercises and it was like a badge of honor to train hard. Like people were, you know, doing 12 rep squats with, uh, you know, 400 pounds or 350 pounds, you know, just pushing themselves yeah. so they almost collapsed. And that's the kind of training you have to do. You really got to push your body in order to change it. Your body always wants to stay where it's at and doesn't want to change. So if you have a fast metabolism, your body wants to stay skinny. If you're a fat guy, your body wants to stay fat. If you want to change your body from where it's at, you have to really push it as far as the training and the nutrition and everything. But if you push yourself hard enough and if you believe in yourself and you work hard enough, you can do it. It's not all about drugs. It's, it really is just about hard work and and proper nutrition and training. Yeah, it's it's funny how you mentioned uh, like the '80s because I've noticed like I read this an article somewhere too how we're at a day and age where we have so much information at our disposal. Yeah, but you don't. But you take your average gym goer and they don't look as good as they could. You know, we're all with all this information. Yeah. It's because there's too much information. Whereas like back in the '80s, it's like you want like a big big back. Like you know, do heavy pulls. You know, do heavy rows. Heavy pull-ups you know, yeah some heavy shrugs yeah. or whatever and it's like and we got our information from the magazine so that was all we had. Era, yeah yeah but it's like but at the same time like it worked you know you guys still got bigger you guys yeah. still got stronger and i feel like it's like you guys overanalyzed it a lot less you know yeah and yeah when i read the magazines i mean i would see what arnold was doing and robbie robinson and they all trained with free weights barbells and dumbbells so that's where i got my philosophy and I knew that the way to get big was to use as much weight as you can with those basic exercises for like six to eight reps. So I was always trying yeah. to get stronger to do as many, as much weight as I could for six to eight reps. You know, so if I was doing, let's say, incline dumbbell presses uh, with the hundreds, like when I was 20 years old, I could maybe get that uh, three or four times. So I'd have my partner help me and get a couple more reps. So I'd get like six. And then eventually, you know, a few weeks later, I'd be able to get that six reps by myself. So... And then once I got six or eight reps with the hundreds, I'd go up to the 105s or 110s. I was always pushing it to use as heavy weight as I could for that six to eight rep range because I knew that was the best for building muscle mass. Because that's what all the big guys did in the magazine. So I was just following them. Just, to, just getting super strong in those moderate rep ranges. and like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree. Okay. Okay, so... So back to like the drugged up, uh, back to the drugs, right? Okay. Okay, I, I want to know your thoughts on this, John. So what I've noticed is that if you look at YouTube and like, let's say when it first started, like 2006-ish, yeah. and there were fitness channels dropping, a lot of viewers, they used to criticize guys would hop on, on gear. They'd be like, wow, why, why are you on gear? Like, um, you're a coward, you know, you're cheating. Yeah. And you fast forward to 2012, 20, like 2012, like every six years, you know, 2012. Yeah. Now it's becoming more accepted, you know? Yeah. Just like how in the job market, tattoos, piercings, 
Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, you know, women doing all this stuff to their body, like just it's becoming more accepted. Right. So and then you fast forward to today and it's almost like it's praised and more respected. It's almost like if you were to take a natural guy like me and then take a teenager who hops on gear and everybody knows he hops on gear. It's almost yeah. like he's going to get more res respect, you know, right? Because right. because he looks better. And it's like I feel like we're at a point now where nobody even cares what you're on or what you're doing or what it took to get there. It's That's just true. about like right now who looks better. Yeah. And I want to know what, what are your thoughts on that? Because I don't really let it bother me too much, but sometimes it bugs me just a little bit how like people could just be so ignorant. How yeah. someone could work so hard for their body and then someone else could just like, you know, just run like some serious stuff and yeah. get that look, get that strength. But they didn't yeah. really work for it, but they're still getting the respect they deserve. And you see this with like a bunch of YouTubers. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I see the same thing. I think guys like um, Rich Piana when he was around and uh, Boston Lloyd. These guys come out and they say exactly what they're taking, and I think people really uh, they like their honesty, and that's what's made them those guys so popular. But at the same time, it's almost saying that steroid use is okay, you know, and that it's all right to use them. And now it's like you said, it's become more accepted, and now everybody feels okay about taking them and about telling everybody what they're taking and things like that. And uh, the thing, like I said, the thing you have to remember is. These steroids are just, it's just a temporary effect. You can't stay big on them all the time. I mean, you can't stay on them all the time. You have to get off them. And you, you can see the health effects that some of these bodybuilders are going through right now. Uh, we had, you know, Dallas McCarver died last year. Rich Piana died last year. Some of that may be due to steroids, some, but there's no doubt about it. If they weren't taking steroids, if they weren't taking all the stuff they were, I think those guys would still be alive today. And, uh, you know, all these guys who are pushing it to the limit like that, you're going to have health effects. I remember John Baylick, the guy who owned uh, um, Iron Man magazine. John's older than me, and he's been around a long time. And he used to say all the time, there's no free lunch. You're not going to be able to take these powerful drugs and get these effects without having side effects. You're going to have side effects. There's going to be repercussions down the road. So why not learn just to do this naturally? Why not learn how to do it with just your training and your nutrition and building your body naturally? You know, when bodybuilding started back in the 1800s, the whole idea of bodybuilding was to build a healthier body. That's why it's called bodybuilding. And if you look at back, there's a, a book called Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors written by Randy Roach. And he examines like how bodybuilding started in the very beginning. And those bodybuilders back then, they were examining nutrition. Like, well, what would it be if we ate raw food? What would it be like if we ate raw beef? I mean, they were, they were looking at nutrition like nobody else had ever looked at it before. Everybody else was just eating food. And they were looking at food as nutrition and how it could help build the body. And how they could do different exercises to build the body. But the whole idea was just to build better health. And then steroids got into it when competition started along. And now it's like they don't care about health at all. They just care about building the body. So we've gone a, a total 180 degree turn from when it started, when bodybuilding started to where it is now. And I think bodybuilding could be one of the healthiest and, and greatest uh, activities you could do. And I've, I've talked to some guys and I've worked with some guys that are masters competitors in their 70s. Um, a friend of mine, Merle Hall from uh, Chicago, he, he's like 75 years old. The guy never took a steroid in his life. He's 75. He has total health. He outlifts most of the guys in the gym. Um, he's got abs all year round. He's never been on any medications. I mean, think about that. How many 75-year-olds do you know that have never been on any medications? There's guys in their 40s now who are on blood pressure medication or different yeah. kind of medications for all kinds of stuff. I mean, that's how healthy this sport can be. If you pursue it from that angle, you know, so nobody's going to stay big forever. I don't know why these kids would take all these drugs to get big when they could just do it with training and nutrition and they could build their body naturally and they'll be in complete total health they'll have great health for the rest of their life. So I hope right. the tide turns and I, cause I agree with you. I think that's, it's like accepted now and uh, hopefully people will change their attitudes about that. You know? Yeah. Like, like what you said about the 75 year old guy, like, um, the problem is that teenagers, they'll hear stories like that and yeah. they'll, they'll just be like, Hey, big deal. You know, right. they, ha they have, it's like, they have this philosophy. Like I'd rather they say like the kind of way they, the way they think is like, I'd rather be a lion for 50 years than a sheep for a hundred years. You know, that, that's the kind yeah. of mentality they have, you know? And it's like what you said about the, the, the health thing. It's like it used, the magazines, I think they used to be called health and fitness, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. And, and now it's like it's not even it's not even health and it's barely even fitness. It's just like ego. Right, right. You know? And the it's, thing about when you're a teenager, you think you're going to live forever and you think you're going to stay young forever. But uh, they think 30 years old is old, you know, when you, they think if you, when oh, you get yeah. to 30. But it goes by fast. I can tell you that for sure because I'm in my 50s and I, I'm like, where did the last 20 years go? Because it goes by so fast. And when you get older, your health is really important. And, um, you know, I, I understand what it's like to be young. I was young once, too. And you believe you're invincible and you think you can do whatever you want. But it's not like that. And the bottom line is you don't have to take drugs in order to get big. You don't have to take drugs in order to have a great physique. You can do it naturally. You just got to put the work in. And I think I really think a lot of the problem with a lot of these kids is they're just not being led by the right people. They're following the examples of all these other people who are taking drugs. But you don't have to take the drugs. You know, you don't have to do that. And if they had other people uh, in the limelight who did build great natural physiques and they did it naturally and they were really legitimately natural, um, I think a lot of these kids might be inspired to try and do the same thing. Yeah, for sure. And especially especially for strength too, I find. Like, uh, I find... I find just my opinion, I feel like strength wise you could get pretty like higher like you look at like like some natural powerlifting shows, like me. Yeah. Yeah. Like you got some elite guys there, you know? Then you look mm -hmm. at like it's a natural like bodybuilding, like a lot of guys tend to look pretty stringy, you know? But like yeah. there are yeah. guys out there who are pulling seven hundred naturally, you know. Like Pete Rubish, he pulled seven hundred without being on anything, you know? And then yeah. then he decided to take that that route. But those are the kinds of guys who I really respect because they reached that ceiling and then they openly told their, their audience, okay, you know, and then they got on it. But it's yeah. like, I feel like you have to, you have to pay your dues if you want to get on some stuff, you know. And even at that, it's optional. You could reach your ceiling and then, and then say, okay, you know, now I'm going to work on, you know, my conditioning, my, uh, this other stuff I'll work on. You know, you don't even have to get on stuff, but if you choose right. to go that route, I feel like if you pay your dues, it's like, you won't even have to run crazy stuff because you, even worst case, if you get off, like you already have this crazy base anyways, you know? Yeah. But like, I, yeah. yeah. I think people should look at it like, um, like a challenge, you know, you should look at bodybuilding like a challenge. That's what I always did. When I started bodybuilding, um, I wasn't into sports when I was a kid. I, I read comic books a lot and I was kind of a shy, insecure kid. I stayed home a lot and read comic books and I didn't play a lot of sports. So I really wasn't an athlete. So I remember when I started bodybuilding when I was 13, 14 years old, I was looking for something to get into. And one of the things I really liked about bodybuilding was that it took a lot of hard work to get there. You know, you have to work hard, you have to train hard, you have to push yourself, you have to eat correctly, you have to stop eating sugar and all that stuff. And I, 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 grew, I, I was a, attracted to the sport because of that. You know, I like the idea of pushing myself. I like the idea of challenging myself and see how hard I could train. And it's not about just taking drugs to make it easier. It's about staying natural and make it harder and then overcoming that and, and you know, accomplishing your goals and doing it. It's okay to work hard. There's no there's nothing wrong with having to spend years in the gym busting your ass, you know, in order to get to where you wanted to get to. I think that's that's what I always liked about bodybuilding was the hard work. And then when you decide to compete, same thing. You have to go through that diet. The diet is hard work, whether you're doing drugs or not. But, you know, do, when you do it naturally and you – you learn how to diet and you learn how to get rid of that fat through, you know, tra uh, training and uh, diet and cardio. And you push yourself to that point and you get to that point and you're up on stage and you win the show or don't win the show and you've achieved that physique and you've done it naturally. That's something to really be proud of because then you know that you did it all. It wasn't the drugs that did it. And nobody could ever say, oh, well, you just take steroids and look like that. You know, you did it. It was all you that did it naturally. And I, I like the idea of pushing yourself and challenging yourself. I think that's one of the real great benefits of bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. But before, okay, so before we talk about the the arm arm portion, the nutrition, it's the last okay. it's the last drug thing I want to address. So uh, I want to know, like, I want to know your opinion on this. I like to I like to tell guys that, like. One thing a lot of these teenagers are gonna, are gonna say, or just people in general who hop on stuff, is look, I'm just gonna get on low test, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. And I like I like to tell them, have you ever seen anybody with one tattoo? Because I've never <laughs> right. seen I've never seen anybody with one tattoo. The second somebody gets one, they're already talking yeah. about like you know 
they get like a little like a little shoulder tattoo. They're already talking about the sleeve. And they're talking about the next sleeve. Right. And the same thing could be applied with gear. You know, I feel like I've never seen anybody just get on low test. Right. Like they'll get on low test. Like and then, and we're not talking about like TRT when you're like you know like fifty years old. I'm talking like you know right. people like under forty here. Like when they get on it, they're like, hey, this isn't that bad because they're young, you know, and they just started whatever. But then they think, okay, well, I could get away with this very well, you know. And now, now since they're not natural, they're comparing themselves to, to high like people who are not natural, you know. So now, like their body dysmorphia is at another level because now it's like yeah. instead of just comparing yourself to naturals online, you're comparing yourself to like the pianos and stuff, you know. So it's right, like right. what I'm trying to say is, it never stops, you know. So what's your yeah. experience with that? Like, you mind telling the audience about like I don't know, like stories, like people you've know, like how like. Once you get on stuff, you're most likely just gonna. It's just gonna keep going up from there too. Yeah. Because well, also what you, what you just said too about a young guy getting on low test. I mean, why would a young guy have to get on test at all? I mean, his his body's already producing so much testosterone as it is. It's really just a matter of of training hard and fueling your body. Like I was saying, I had to eat so much food. I was eating like 700 grams of complex carbs a day in order to gain weight and get bigger. You know, when I was going through that bulking phase. But that's, but I really didn't even get that fat from doing that because my metabolism was so fast and my hormone levels were so high. My testosterone levels were high. My growth hormone levels were just naturally high from all, you know, from being a young guy. So I don't understand why a young guy would have to, you know, take so much or even start on anything at all because he's already got so much naturally on his own. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of just working hard, eating enough food and, and training hard to get there, you know. Yeah, I was reading an article and apparently they're saying how, on average, your your height you stop growing at around like twenty one twenty you know nineteen yeah. ish, but they were saying this article how, like your clavicles, they stop growing at around like twenty five, so it's like hmm. okay, it's very it's very interesting, and how like yeah. a lot of these people are still growing you know and if you're a teenager who's like sixteen seventeen years old like you're not even yeah. done like. You could you could still be getting taller for all we know, you know. So right, it's like, right. Well, I'll tell you, I used to do. Um, you know what dumbbell pullovers are for the yeah, chest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to lay across, not not on the bench, but across ways across the bench, and holding a dumbbell and, and getting that real good stretch, and that really made my rib rib cage bigger. So I've got a really big rib cage now. I can do a great vacuum pose, and I look really good. Like when I do the front double bicep, and I got a lot of width there, and I'm absolutely convinced that those dumbbell pullovers helped increase the size of my rib cage. And I did those when I was when I very first started training at 14 years old. And I also did really a lot of wide grip chin ups. And I always had really wide lats. And I don't know if that helped uh, with my clavicle width because I've got wide clavicles. But I'm I know for sure that the pullovers helped with the rib cage and the the chins, the wide grip chins really helped me develop uh, wide lats. So I did that right at the beginning when I was 14 years old. So yeah, I agree with you. You can really change your structure if you do the right stuff, you know, at a young age. Do you, uh, a quick question on the pullover though, like, uh, how'd you do them? Did you do them like lying across the bench? And what was like the heaviest you've got on them? Like, like your 10 reps yeah, or something? Still, I would do them at the end of my chest workout. I see a lot of guys do them with their back workout, but I would do chest because that's the way everybody else did it back then. We would do bench press, incline press, flies, and then I would do them. So if the bench is here, I would lay like this way across it. So only my upper back was on the bench. And I would hold the dumbbell above my head, and you get a really good stretch. Bring it down to like the level of the bench, but I would really expand the rib cage. And uh, you don't really have to go that heavy. Although I would go up to like 100 pound dumbbells, I've gone maybe 110, 120. But as long as the uh, the form is really good, it also gets a little bit of your upper lats, and it builds your serratus muscles, which are by your um, by your abdominals. Yeah. So yeah. when you get real ripped, and you have the serratus, the intercostals, the abdominals. And all that's ripped, it, it really adds another dimension to that. So that was like a staple exercise that we always did in the 70s and 80s. And uh, a lot of guys don't do that now, but it's great exercise for really developing that big rib cage. Yeah, it's, it's very underrated, I find. Like, in, I yeah. For, especially for lats, too. Like, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a but great exercise for lats because it isolates it without using your biceps, you know. And it's funny that you're talking about a big rib cage because I feel like. Um, like I'm naturally like broader, or whatever. Like my my parents are pretty broad, but uh -huh. like the rib cage is something I always respected because like from the yeah. side from the side view, I've noticed people who have like 
who happen to have a big rib cage, he gives them like they have they tend to have a thicker upper back. I yeah, find. yeah. From the side yeah. view, like they have like that really like that thick pop, and like right. I feel like the width. I feel like the width thing is cool. It's cool to be like wide and stuff, but like I find thickness is like way more impressive. You know, like because people yeah, are, you see people yeah. who are wide all the time, like basketball players, like they're still lanky. You know, yeah. But if someone yeah. if somebody's thick, like. They don't get that skinny guy card, you know, like because they're thick, you know, like you look right. up in the side, they look more like meaty, look more beefy, you know. Right, right. But um, anyway, back in the day too, when we did a side chest pose, they always did it with the lifted rib cage. You know, you see Arnold do the side chest pose; he would put his arms underneath the rib cage and lift the rib cage up, and it looked way better, I think, than the way they do it now. You know. So speaking of poses, like, in your honest opinion, what do you think are the three like most important poses in bodybuilding? I know there's no right or wrong answer to this, but what are the ones that you find are like, if you could pull off these three poses very well, like your big period? Um, well, standing relaxed to the front is very important because when you compete in competitions, that's where the judges will first see you when you come out, you're standing relaxed. And that's the position you'll be in the most because in between poses, but I know that's not a pose. Uh, I would say the front double bicep is really important because that's the first pose they ask for. And if you do that pose right and you look good in that pose, that really has a lot of power. Um, I think the abdominal pose is also very important because today contests are really judged on hardness and conditioning and who's the most ripped. So if you have ripped abdominals, that's usually a big, a big part of winning a contest. And then probably um, the, last the, rear, the rear double bicep too is important because... Oh, yeah, they look at the they look at the back a lot. The back is important. A lot of guys that look really good from the front, and you turn them around, they don't look good from the back. And you can see the hamstrings. They judge the glutes a lot now, so you can see the glutes, the hamstrings, the calves, the lower back, and uh, you can see all that from the back. So I think that's a real important pose, also. Wow, that, that, that's a good point. Cause you don't think it's the last part. You think it's the the double, back double bicep. Yeah, because even like the classic physique, they don't even ask for the lat spread. You know, they just ask for the rear double bicep. Okay, and so it, shows, it shows off the rear delts really well too, huh? Like upper back. Yeah, so. yeah, you can see everything. You know, you can see everything. Those poses were designed so you could see every part of your body, you know, from every angle. And I think there's like eight mandatory poses. But, you know, they designed those so you can't hide anything. You can't hide any weak points. You might look good in some poses, but then other poses will expose your weak points. So... Wow. It's really hard to look good in all your all the mandatory poses, you know. That's crazy, but hands down, my favorite pose you just mentioned is the relax, because it's like yeah, most yeah. people aren't aren't competing, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that's the ultimate goal here is that most people want to like most lifters they want to look good relaxed, you know. Yeah, like I find I find flexing is cool, but it's like if you're not competing and you're not yeah. like practicing posing and stuff like that. Like, when are you really going to flex? Unless you're doing it for, like, you know, marketing purposes. But, like, the right, average right. Joe, the average guy who lifts, they want to look good, relaxed, you know. And I feel like right. that's that's when you know someone's big, you know. It's like when you see them in, yeah. when you see them downtown, you see them in public, in the yeah. summertime, not, like, in the winter where everyone's wearing jackets. And you see them, like, in a right. hot day, and they're just relaxed walking on the street. And if they could look big like that. Yeah. Like, no yeah, no I, lat flare, no, like, nothing like right, that. Right, like, stand in there, yeah. Relax, you know, like, uh, you don't have to flex your traps, nothing, just look, like, big, like, yeah, like, that's super important, but. Well, that's uh, why Steve Reeves was so popular. I don't know if you remember Steve Reeves from the 1940s. He was in a lot of Hercules movies, and he inspired a lot of people to work out. I have a I have a website called Bodybuilding Legend Show where I interview a lot of the legendary bodybuilders from the old days, and I have it on uh, a podcast also called the Bodybuilding Legends Podcast. And uh, a lot of the older guys that I interviewed, from even from the 60s, they all say that Steve Reeves was the guy that they looked up to, and that was the reason why they started bodybuilding. And Steve Reeves was a real good-looking guy, but he had wide shoulders and a small waist. And just walking down the street, they, I heard stories about Steve Reeves walking down the beach, and people would follow him. You know, he had, like, all these people following him. Women would follow him, guys would follow him, because he looked like a Greek god, you know, because this is back in the 1940s before... People were really working out, and he just looked so great just standing there, you know. So I think that's you're right. I mean, if you have a if you have a great physique where you can stand and just look great just standing there, because how many times are you gonna pose? Like you said in public, you know. Wow, Steve. Yeah, Steve Reeves is a yeah for sure. But apparently he was natural, yeah. like for like a, a good a good chunk of his career too, no? 
Yeah, I, he says he was natural, and I believe him because um, I don't really think steroids were were very around very back then. I mean, they said testosterone started in the 50s, but I don't think it was too readily available. I think steroids were mostly used in the 1960s, I think, and he was already retired by then. So, yeah, I think he was natural. And Reg Park was another Mr. Universe winner. Uh, he was natural, I think, for most of his career, if not all of his career, and he was another really impressive physique. There were some really great physiques back then before steroids were around. So, you know, that's just proof positive you don't really need drugs to build a great physique, you know. Hey, my, my buddy, uh, my good YouTuber is um, Alpha Destiny. Like, he posted a video back then where he was talking about Steve Reeves and, like, a lot of the people <laughs> in the comments were, like, how saying how he's small, you know. And <laughs> and that's because, like, the standards nowadays are, like, you know, people see Steve Reeves and they compare him to, like, the yeah. next big YouTuber, and they're like, wow, Steve Reeves d d doesn't even look that good, you know? But it's yeah. like, if you look at it from, like, another standpoint, like, Steve Reeves was huge, you know? Huge lots. Yeah, for sure, yeah. He's still a big dude, you know? Yeah, well, I, I think even when I see pictures of him today, I think he still looks great. You know, he's still like, a great physique. And I think even if he was walking out on the beach today and looking like he did then, back then, um, I think a lot of people would still be impressed with him. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, that was 60 years ago. Of course, things are going to be different now, you know? Everything's different now. Yeah. But I, I, I like to tell guys, too, I, like, the standards are way different. Mm -hmm. But I feel like our uh, most people, like, our work ethic, discipline, and drive is, like, way lower. And it's just the drugs that are, like, higher, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I remember, like, back in the day, um, and when I, I interviewed Dorian Yates recently, and he mentioned this, too. He said, um, everybody back in the day would talk about the training they did. You know, I remember, like, when I was growing up, we would always hear stories about Tom Plax and squatting. I mean, Tom Plax was an unbelievable squatter. I would see pictures of him in Flex Magazine, and he'd be squatting with six plates on each side of the bar. He'd come all the way outside the squat rack, and he'd be going all the way down and all the way up. You know, it was amazing. And then he would do, like, uh, 40 reps with 315, or he would do 225 for 10 minutes straight. You know, and then we hear how he collapsed at the squat rack. You know, they had to carry him out of the gym and stuff, you know. I mean, that, that was the stuff we, we always heard about. And we hear about Arnold do, doing supersets with chest and back for like, uh, you know, 40 sets. Or It was all about hard work. You know, it was all about how hard these guys trained. They never talked about drugs. They were all taking steroids too, but it was more about hard work and how, how hard they trained and how, push, how hard they pushed themselves. And I think that's what's more important, you know, than – I think that's been downgraded a lot. People don't talk about that anymore. And Dorian, too. Dorian was a real hard trainer. I mean, Dorian said that the yeah. reason why he became such a great bodybuilder was because he trained harder than everybody else. When he went to the Mr. Olympia every year, he's like, I have, he, he never feared losing because he goes, I know for sure, without a doubt, nobody's trained as hard as me. You know, he, he pushed himself to the limit, and he knew when he trained for Mr. Olympia, he said he knew that nobody prepared like he did. And he always, he, he would train in uh, England in a dungeon gym, and he, he compared himself to these bodybuilders in California who were out in the sunshine and like Flex Wheeler and Sean Ray. And he said, I know those guys aren't training as hard as me. And that's why he always stayed in England when he was winning that Mr. Olympia contest because he knew that set him apart from everybody else. Yeah. No, yeah, I think, I think Dorian's probably one of my favorite bodybuilders of all time. Like, for sure, top three. Yeah. Like, his back is just like, you know. But, like, yeah. the, thing, the thing with Dorian and... Um, and Tom Platts is like their pain tolerance was on like a complete different level, you know. Like yeah. These, these guys were able to withstand pain, like they like, especially like in their departments, you know, like like Tom Platts when it came to leg training, like you see him like doing like his hamstring curls, like to like yeah to fucking dies, and you see Dorian like doing his rows, like yeah, and it's just like well, it's it's not it's really crazy. pain tolerance; it's just how bad you want it, and I think you really have to push yourself to do it. You know, I remember. I had a training partner when I was 16 years old, and uh, this guy was crazy. He was older than me, and I think he was trying to destroy me. I think he was trying to, like, get me to quit. And he would push me to the point where we would do legs, and we would superset leg presses and squats, leg presses and squats, and we'd go to failure, and we'd, end, we'd always end up, like, throwing up. Like, one or, one or both of us would run outside, and we'd have to throw up in the grass, you know? And when I trained with him, I think we were training, like, maybe a little too hard, but I learned how to train hard when I trained with him, and I learned that when you train, it's almost like you have to you have to you have to flip the switch, and in your brain that and the brain the brain will try to protect the body, you know. So whenever you're going through any kind of pain or whatever, your brain will say stop, stop, stop. You're hurting yourself, 
you have to be able to almost turn that switch off, turn your brain off, and push to, push yourself to the point where you're just going to train to all out intensity without any failure. You know, and that takes that takes some time to learn how to train like that, and it really helps if you have somebody pushing you to the point where you can train that hard. But I think once you learn how to train like that, you can have some amazing workouts, and that's when you can really get big and really, you know, really improve your physique. And that's what training intensity is all about. You, you really got to want it. It comes from the mind, but you really got to push yourself to the limit, you know. Yeah, and the body just like a the body just like a puppet, you know. And the mind, yeah. like the mind controls everything. Yeah, so if you could like, if you, yeah, I agree. So, so the takeaway message for like the. Um, for the for these teenagers and just people who want to hop on and just like guys have to, you guys should I I'd invite you guys to wait a little bit longer you know or like not even yeah. consider it at all you know yeah you know so Tell them stop stop being a pussy and train hard <laughs> <laughs> yeah like God forbid you have to go to the gym like four days right. a week and like work hard you know lift some weights yeah and, and challenge like, yourself and, and see how how far you can go you know how big can you get naturally can you get to two hundred pounds can you get to two hundred twenty pounds how big can your arms get naturally? Can you get like 19 inch arms natural? I mean, that should be the goal. The goal should be, you know, how heavy can you train? How hard can you train? How big can you get without doing any drugs? You know, challenge yourself. I mean, a lot of these guys could really be great bodybuilders and have great physiques if they just push themselves. Stop just taking drugs like everybody else is taking them. You know, it's just not going to get you anywhere. You got to do it naturally. You got to build your body naturally. There's nothing wrong with being natural. You know, I think a lot of people like you were saying, they look down on you if you're natural. There's nothing wrong with doing it on your own. And when you get to the point where people say, he's not natural, he's not natural, that's when you know you made it. Because now you've got a great physique, you know, on your own, and people are actually thinking you're a liar, that you, you know, mm. you're taking drugs. That's when you know you've really made it as a natural bodybuilder. But it, it's funny you say how there's nothing to be ashamed about when you, about being natural, you know? And right. I feel like, I feel like, I'm, I'm going to make a video on this too, but I feel like one of the main reasons why a lot of natural lifters look like shit is because it's the vibe that they give off. It's the presence yeah. that they have when they walk into a room. And a lot of natural lifters, they tend to, they tend to be very like. They have a lot of them. A lot of them have, tend to have low confidence because they're comparing themselves to everyone on the internet. You know. Yeah. yeah. I actually had like, people say I look way bigger. And people say in videos I look I look way bigger in person than I do in videos. Yeah. And I actually had a guy tell me the other day like, you look way bigger than that guy on the other side of the room. But yeah. the other guy on the other side of the room was way bigger than me. But, yeah. but he was insecure. You could tell by the way, like, you know, he just yeah. didn't have, like, whereas me, I'm a little bit more confident. And the vibe I give off is, like, I'm, I'm comfortable with being a natural, you know. I embrace it and I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I feel like that's what, that's what it comes down to. Like, it's like, are you happy in your own body? You know, and a lot of people aren't. Yeah. Well, that's what bodybuilding is all about is building up your, not only your body, but also your mind and, uh, you know, building up your confidence, and I think that comes with time. And I think every little uh, accomplishment we do in bodybuilding, whether we put another inch on our arms or we lost an inch off our waist or whatever, I think that's uh, just helps to build our confidence and build our mind. And it's just step by step. You know, it gets better and better. So um, yeah, I just I agree with you, man. I just think there's a lot that these guys can accomplish naturally, and they just have to push themselves to do it. You know, and they should be proud of their bodies and. And they should try to do it naturally because, like I said, there's no free lunch, you know, and you're going to have to pay the piper sooner or later. And if you start doing these drugs, uh, you're going to have to get off them and then you're going to have to start all over. I've seen a lot of guys in the past who use drugs to build their body and then something happened. They got some health problems or whatever. They had to get off the drugs and it's like, man, they lose everything. You know, it's like they, they never lifted before. It's, and they go to the gym and everybody's like, what happened to you? What happened <laughs> yeah, to you? yeah, exactly. <laughs> So you're better off just doing it with, you know, without the drugs and building your base and building your your physique and doing it uh, just with training and nutrition. That that's the funniest thing I find. It's like when these guys like they have no confidence, then they get on drugs and like drugs. It's not just like the, you obviously know this. Like it's not even just the physical. It's like it also affects like your how you think, yeah. like mentally, you know. And yeah, I've sure. seen guys like hop on cycles and like they're motivated, like they're driven. And I'm yeah, like, well, asked them, like, how do you feel when you're like, did you feel like this when you weren't on drugs? And like, no, not at all. I'm like, yeah, yeah. watch when you hop off or you have to hop off. Like, you're going to be fucking depressed, you know? Right, right. And, like, <laughs> and that's why and that's why a lot of guys won't stop taking them. Because they feel stop. that when they get off, they go right back on. Yeah, they can't, they can't stay off them. You're right. So it's like, it's like, it's a, it's a trap, you know? And I feel like 
Yep. I feel like most people would be very wise to just like stay away from it, you know, but yeah, we'll I agree. Let's jump into a bit of arms because I know you said your tracks just weren't the best, you know? Yeah. And I feel like most natural lifters, like people like to say like the, the traps, like it's very hard to build traps naturally. Uh huh. And I, I agree. But at the same time, like the thing with traps, like you lift so heavy and like, you, I feel like most guys could get some really big traps naturally, you know? Yeah. Like, people are saying like, you know, there's less an engine receptors in your natural and stuff like that. But like mm -hmm. I feel like traps, like come on, like you, you power clean, you know, three plates, or you're doing like you know, yeah. seven hundred pound like snatch grip shrugs, like you can get some pretty big traps. But I feel like it's actually the triceps. I rarely ever see like drug free lifters with big triceps. At least in yeah. my opinion, like you never see like those thick like tricep long heads. Like mm -hmm. most most naturals tend to struggle like with in this department, you know. So, what's your take on the close grip bench press? Like everyone on the internet is saying it's the best tricep builder of all time, like. I don't know if you do it or not. I haven't like analyzed your training to that point, but what do you find are some tips to make it more like a better tricep builder where it's like you don't feel it all on your shoulders and all on your pecs? Yeah. Um, well, I think like with any body part, any muscle group, I think if you do the compound movements or the basic exercises where you're using a, a couple body parts instead of just one body part, not an isolation exercise, I think those are the best ones for building mass because you can use more weight. So like a close grip bench press for the triceps or dips for the triceps, you're not only using your triceps, but you're also using your front deltoids so you can use more weight and it can be more of a mass builder. Um, I do close grip benches also, uh, but they, they are sort of hard to do because, you know, your, your grip is closer. What I tend to do is I keep my elbows in tight instead of uh, bringing them out and I bring it to the lower part of the chest. But I'll tell you, another exercise I just started a couple months ago, I saw some power lifters doing this, so I thought I would try it. And I really like it. I actually like it almost better than close grip benches. Let me guess. Is, uh, let me guess. Let me guess. <laughs> it's the reverse grip bench, right? No, no. Oh, I have a hard okay, time okay. with that one. I can't okay, do okay. <laughs> This okay. is um, bench presses off the floor. floor so you lay, on a, you lay on the floor and, and right by a power rack, and I grab the bar kind of close, almost as close as I do with a close grip bench, Not about a medium grip. And uh, it's, I just go all the way down to my elbows hit the floor. I pause for a second, and then I, I push it up really hard and lock out on top. And that really gets uh, the outer head, the lateral head of my triceps. So it's really a great exercise, and I'm really getting strong on it. And I feel that actually more than the close grip bench. So that's a really good uh, exercise for guys who are having trouble building their triceps. And then dips are really good, um, if, especially locking out at the top. If you can get strong enough where you can use a weight belt, and use a 25 pound plate or two 25 pound plates and just lock out on the top. Those, that's a real good exercise for the triceps. And then um, the, the long head of the tricep is really the, mu the part of the muscle that makes the triceps look big. Mm. So that would be any kind of overhead extension like with your arms over your head. You could do the dumbbell or you could do a barbell. Slight incline, so it's still a real high incline. And I keep the elbows really high, pointed towards the ceiling, and get a really good stretch. And with that exercise, it's not so important to go really heavy with the weight. Because if you start going heavy, you're not going to get a good stretch and contraction. So if you just use, like, moderately heavy weight and get a really good stretch. Like, what I'll do is I'll do that bench on the floor first, because that's the power exercise. Then I'll go to dips, because that's another good power exercise. And then I'll finish off with that uh, seat, the uh, incline extensions, where you're getting a really good stretch. Or bench dips is another good one for the for the long head of the tricep, or uh, cable extensions where you're bending forward at the waist and you're keeping your elbows by your ears and then extending straight out. That's another good one for the long head of the tricep. Um, so if you can build the long head of the tricep and the lateral head of the tricep, uh, those are the real uh, parts of the of the muscle that makes it look bigger. You know. But for, it's interesting. But for the floor press, did you go close grip? Yeah, not, it's not a, a wide grip like a be regular bench press. It's uh, in a little bit more. It's not real close, but it's more of a medium grip, and I keep the elbows pointed towards the legs. So when I go down, it's almost like a, almost like a close grip bench, and I pause it for a second when my elbows hit the floor, and then I lock it out real hard on top. Okay, and your, your elbows don't relax. Like they're just like they, they skin the floor, and then they... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't totally relax. I mean, I'm, I'm real tight and, and tensed up and then push it all the way up. I've seen a lot of power lifters at my gym do it because they're trying to get that lockout, you know. And yeah, uh, yeah. it really, really helps with the tricep development, though. But for some bodybuilders, like, I know there's no right or wrong answer, but 
with the whole constant tension thing, like, do you <laughs> like to lock out on your close grip bench? I mean, you're on your floor presses and close grip bench and dips. Yeah, on that exercise I do, but if I do the extensions, I don't lock out. I try to keep the tension on it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And what about what about the reverse grip bench? Have you never tried it before? I just never really feel it. I, I tried it before. I feel it more in my deltoids. Um, but, but if it feels good to you, you know, then, then it, you should do it because it's that's another mass builder and that's another uh, compound exercise. But it just all depends on, you know, whether you feel it or not. Okay, interesting. Okay. Okay, let's talk about – let's talk. we're going to go back and forth, bicep, tricep forms. Okay. Later. But um, when it comes to barbell curls, you know, let's say you're doing – let's say easy bar curls. Okay. Overhand, underhand, whatever, close grip. Um, you see a lot of bodybuilders, they, they bring the bar to the chin. You, know? mm -hmm. you see a lot of other guys that bring it to the chest. And I know there's no right or wrong answer here, but a lot of people are saying, like, when you go to the chin, even though there's a little bit more front delt, you're getting that extra range of motion. Yeah. So from the years the years you spend, like, you know, doing curls or analyzing people doing curls drug-free, what do you feel like tends to work best? Like, do you feel like do you feel like people should be like doing like touching the chin or like going at least very close to it on all the warm up sets? Then as it gets heavier, they should just like strive for like to go like nipple line, or should they always strive to like to go to that chin level? Well, I, I think I almost think it's like two different exercises. The way I've always done barbell curls is um, I keep the elbows pulled way back and I sort of arch my lower back so my chest is sticking out. And when you do that, it keeps your elbows way back. And then when your elbows are locked in by your waist. When you pull up, I, I try to keep the elbows always locked right by the waist and just come up. So I'm just coming up to chest height. And I think that's uh, that's a better mass builder um, for the biceps. And that's the way I've always done them. But it's funny you said that about the chin because I, I have been trying that for the last few weeks. I've been using a lighter weight and coming up and going up to the chin and like squeezing it on top, which is more of a peak contraction. So I think to get more of a peak contraction, bringing it up and squeezing it is a better way to do it, even though you are bringing in the front deltoids, like you said. But keeping the elbows back, keeping the chin, the chest up, and then curling up and keeping those elbows back the whole time, I think that's a better mass builder. And if you ever see like videos of Arnold, like when he was in his 20s, he used to do like real heavy cheek curls with 275 pounds, and that's how he would do them. He would keep your elbows way back, his chest up, and just sort of swing up the weight he did it as a strength exhibition exercise, but um, I think that's a really good way to build more muscle mass in your biceps. Yeah, all, all the biggest guys are the biggest um, in biceps, that, like drug free or not, like they all did cheat curls, you know? Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. it's the same thing with rows too, like you know, all the biggest guys all did cheat rows, you know? Yeah. It's impossible, yeah. it's impos pretty much impossible to do like 405 strict, you know, like, so right. this, is, this is very hard, you know, like for on a barbell row. Yeah. And if you look at the barbell row, I mean, the barbell row is working your back. So the weak link in that exercise is your biceps. So if you do them really, really strict, if you lock your back and you're only letting the bar come down to arm length and you pull it up, your biceps are going to give out way before your back. So when you start using heavier weights, you're never going to really train your back heart. So the way I always did barbell rows was we would stand on a block and we would get a really good stretch and we'd arch the lower back with the knees bent and then just like get a little swing to get it up. And then once you get it past that little, the beginning part of the exercise, you're pulling with your back, but you're able to overload the muscles of the back by using way heavier weight. And your yes, biceps sir. are still going to get work too, but you're really training your back way more than you would be if you were really strict. And when people have seen me do uh, barbell rows or they've seen videos of me doing barbell rows, they go, that's terrible form. That's terrible form. He, you know, he's cheating way too much, but I'm not cheating. I'm just, I'm really working the back. Because you have to do that. You can't do an exercise like that super strict. Otherwise, you're going to train your biceps more than your – your biceps are going to give out before you really train your back. And I've always had like – my back's one of my best body parts. So obviously, the exercise is working, you know, and I'm, I'm able to develop a really big back with it. And people say, oh, well, you just had a genetically good back. Well, my back's not genetically that good. I mean, it takes a lot of training to build that much muscle mass. And barbell rows, I think, were the number one exercise for me to building a, a big back. And that's an exercise I see a lot of guys do wrong. Mm -hmm. Now that we're on the topic of back, like, um, I think barbell rolls are absolutely amazing, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, uh, I do, for traps, I, I do a lot of, like, uh, high pulls, you know, snatch grip high pulls. Yeah, those are great. And, like, How many do those anymore? 
yeah, they're solid, like, because just it's all stretch, you know, like the, the stretch yeah. at the bottom, that's what makes it grow, you know? And I feel yeah. the barbell row, I call, I, I like I like to call the barbell row, like, a horizontal high pull, you know? Just getting the weight up, and, like, when once you get yeah. that stretch at the bottom, like, you're in the money, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah. I want to know, what are your thoughts on the Yates row? Because I, I never, I, I used to do it, like, from time to time. I'm kind of going back and forth, like, mm-hmm. I like to do most of my rows, like, below the kneecap, like, 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 the bar goes below the knee, you know? I don't do, like, I won't okay. roll it to, like, above the knee and then roll back. But you right, look right. at, like, Dorian Yates, and he, I don't I don't think he went below the knee, you know? He went to, like, right, maybe, like, the middle of the knee on his, yeah. on his Yates rows, and he'd come back up. Yeah. And he had the biggest back, in, like, arguably one of the biggest backs in bodybuilding. So, clearly, there's right. some sort of merit to it because he named the exercise after his name, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, it's like, and you see some bodybuilders who do it, too, and, like, I think... It's not an either or, you know. I think, I think obviously you should be doing barbell rows, you know, where it goes <laughs> like maybe mid shin. You should be doing dumbbell rows and all that stuff. But what's yeah. your take on the Yates row? Do you think it has its place? Like where yeah, you bring the bar like to right, the, like just the knee level, like mid mid knee or like right above the kneecap. Yeah, Dorian did that exercise. He he developed that exercise because he wanted to work more on the lower lats, and he figured if the the elbows were coming in towards his waist. He would focus more on the lower lats instead of the upper back. Um, I don't really like it. I've tried it before, and I feel it more in my biceps. I don't feel it as much in my back. I like doing uh, the rows the old school way, which is a wider grip, almost as like a wider grip as you'd use for a barbell bench press. That's how about how wide I go on a barbell row. And I keep my back parallel to the floor. And I keep my arms real wide, and I keep my elbows real wide. And I find what that does is it really develops your outer lats, like the meat, the middle part of your back, like the meat of the back, uh, the belly of the muscle, I should say. And by going wide, I'm also getting the outer part of the lats, which helped me with my width and also helped me with the thickness because it's a rowing exercise, so it's going to develop the thickness. But because the grip was so wide, I was, I was able to develop the wide part of the lats too. So like when I did a rear lat spread, I had a really good rear lat spread. And I think that was why, because I was doing that barbell row so heavy. So, and I like to go really deep, um, almost to my feet, and then pull back up. You know, so I, mm. I, I think uh, the full range of motion and the wide grip that worked better for me. Whenever I tried to do Dorian's, I felt it more in my bicep, and he tore his bicep doing that. I mean, it was like 400 pounds, but uh, but still, I, I tore my bicep uh, back in 2000. So I've always been leery of anything that puts too much strain on the bicep. You know. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so so going uh, going going back to the arms, right? <laughs> then yeah. we'll finish off with nutrition. Um, I like I like John Meadows a lot. Mm-hmm. One one of his articles is talking about how when he does a lot of his most of his extensions and curls, he believes in like three second eccentrics. Now, I know people like. Eccentrics to get like a bad reputation on and lifting mm-hmm. people are like oh it's boring and like who counts but like yeah. john obviously doesn't count and like most bodybuilders they don't count but like it's right. more of like something to like engage you know like it's more of like a guideline like hey i'm not i'm just not going to drop it you know i'm gonna i'm gonna control right. it so on how many of your curls on average like any of your extensions do you apply this do you do it on all your curls and extensions where it's like you just don't drop it like you have more like a controlled uh, eccentric or yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I, I would definitely control it. And like if I'm doing uh, those incline extensions, I definitely go down slow. Uh, barbell curls, I go down slow. Um, dumbbell curls, yeah, I, I definitely control it, especially a smaller muscle group like the arms. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so we know the stretch is obviously like one of the most important things mm-hmm. when it comes to like growing a muscle. But I want to know how important is the squeeze? Like when it comes to like let's say bicep work, like you train like you know your brachialis or something. Like how important is it to squeeze the top of a hammer curl? I think it depends on the exercise. Like if you're doing a, you know, like a close grip bench or a barbell curl, I don't think it's as important. But if you're doing like a concentration curl, then yeah. or even like a dumbbell pre curl, you know, you definitely need to squeeze it more because that's more of a an exercise where you can focus on the muscle. You know, you're sort of isolating the muscle a little bit more than a mass building exercise. So. Yeah, I think that's definitely important too. Okay. Okay. Last question for arms. Um, what what are the biggest tips you could give us for for brachialis training? Because the brachialis, I feel like it's the most important, one of the most underrated parts of the arm. Like, a lot of people yeah. sh- should be doing more hammer curls. 
or like you know yep. um, reverse curls and stuff. But like yeah. you don't see that many naturals, like some really impressive presses, like brachialises. You know, it's like yeah. So we both say like you know heavy hammers the way to go, and there's no right or wrong answer to this. But like, what do you find tends to work well, at least for you, like for for brachialis training? I like doing uh, hammer curls also, and uh, I do them alternating, and I bring them across my body instead of straight up. I, I feel a little bit more like that, so I bring it across my upper body and almost towards my chin. Um, and then reverse curls with a curling bar is also another good one. You, you don't have to go that heavy on that in order to really feel the brachialis muscle. And another good one uh, that's kind of being used more often now is to do them on a high incline and do like a hammer curl with your thumb up one arm at a time. Like a, it's like a preacher curl, but you, it's more like a, a hammer curl because your thumb is facing forward or thumb is facing up. And if you could do it on a high incline bench, um, I really feel that. I really feel that. That's one exercise you don't have to use a lot of weight, but you can really feel it in the brachialis. Nice. Okay, perfect. Okay, last question for arms, actually. When it comes to pushdowns, you see tons of people doing it like with a vertical torso. You uh -huh. see other guys, they lean forward a little bit more. There's no right or wrong answer once again, but... Right. What, what's your take on this, like... Like, which, which exercise though? Let's say the push down. Oh, push down. Try to um, push down. Yeah. Uh, I like staying straight up. You know, um, I, I've used um, like power push downs before where I, I lean over the bar and I push it down. And that's a pretty good exercise for the medial head of the, of the uh, triceps. But I would say in general, uh, I think triceps is more of a, I mean, push downs is more of a shaping exercise. So I, I just usually go straight up and just really feel the exercise, feel the contraction on the bottom, and then get a good stretch on top. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, so wrap it up some quick nutrition, then we're All done. Right. Okay, so by the way, this advice is for drug-free lifters, obviously, and you know, also I know okay. guy, guys on drugs could get away with a lot of stuff. You know, you got a lot of these drug users, I find, like uh, – they, they, they talk about they're eating clean all the time. Then when you're actually with them, they're going to drive throughs and stuff, you know? So it's like, yeah. it's for drug free lifters. So what do you feel like is the biggest mistakes people make when bulk and cutting? It's a very vague question, but. Um, well, when bulking, I think the big mistake is they eat whatever they want instead of eating good bodybuilding food. When I was bulking up, I would always still eat like really good food. Um, I would, I'd never ate at restaurants very rarely. I almost always ate, uh, just home cooked meals. So I would eat potatoes. I would eat rice. I would eat oatmeal and I would fix all my food and just, I just eat it in greater quantities. So I was still eating really good quality bodybuilding food. I don't believe in this, if it meets your macros type of thing. And I ate just really good quality food, but I just ate more of it when I was bulking up. And, um, when you're cutting up, I think the biggest mistake is people, uh, they just cut their calories too low. What I would always do before I started the diet was I would write down everything I was eating in the off season so I knew exactly how many calories, how much carbs and everything I was eating. And then when I started my diet, I would take that off season diet and just slowly cut it from there. And I would have to get to a certain amount of calories in order to start losing weight. So if I was eating, let's say 4,500 calories in the off season, I might have to go down to 3,000 in order to lose weight. But I would eat as many calories as I could as long as I could slowly lose the weight. I think some guys just jump into a diet and they start cutting their calories real low and they don't know how many calories they're eating and they just go way too low and they start doing too much cardio. I mean, most of the shows I did, a lot of the shows I did as a natural bodybuilder, I did no cardio. I didn't do it unless I absolutely had to. If I wasn't losing the weight fast enough, then I would start to do cardio three days a week. So mm -hmm. if I could lose the cardio with three days a week, then I would just stay with three days a week. Why go to six days a week? I see some guys doing it twice a day, you know, every day. It's crazy. So the main goal as a bodybuilder is you want to keep as much muscle mass as possible and get as ripped as possible. So if you can do that by using less, uh, you know, less cardio and you can eat more calories, then you should do it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk um, cheat meals, right? Okay. I Ideally... If someone were to have a cheat meal, what do you think would be the best time to take it? Be like on an off day, for a workout, after a workout, like uh, off season or pre contest? Uh, say the guy doesn't even compete. 
Yeah. Actually, let, let, let's take both scenarios. Let's take let's take uh, let's take let's say if the guy does compete off season, then compared to in season. I would say off season if you wanted to have one meal on the weekend, you know that would be good. Um, Pre contest, like if I help people get ready uh, for contests or try to lose weight, I always get they always ask me, you know, when do I have a cheat meal? And I'm like, well, lose the weight first. And you know, the only time you would have a cheat meal, I think, when you're dieting, is when you're already lean and your metabolism is really fast and you still got some time left for the contest. Then you can have a cheat meal in order to stimulate your metabolism or you know, in order to slow down the weight loss because you're losing it too fast. But when you're in the process of trying to start losing the fat, um, I don't think you can really do a cheat meal yet. You know, I think you have to just be strict and wait until your body starts losing the fat first. Yeah. What if someone? What if someone doesn't even compete actually, and they just want to like? Um, they're trying to lose weight. Mhm. Mm and they just started like a diet, and uh, they, they want to get. They want to have a cheat meal, but they want to know like what, ideally what would be the best time to take it. Um. Again, I would say maybe just one meal a week, you know, just have one cheat meal a week. But, you know, sometimes when you tell people that, they go crazy and they, like, they never ate before. So then they, they end up putting themselves so far behind, it takes them, like, a week to get back to where they were. So that doesn't do any good, you know. Um, so you just got to be really careful as far as, you have to know the person you're working with. If they have a pretty fast metabolism, then maybe they can get away with the cheat meal. Um, but it just has to be right for their body. And you might even have to tell them, like, what to eat. So they don't go crazy with it, you know, and just go like nuts. Because a lot of people do that; they just go crazy. But but that one cheat meal they're taking a week. Does it have to be on a training day, non-training day? Like uh, I don't I don't think it really matters. It doesn't matter. Just as long as they get that one cheat meal. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, what's your thoughts on the um, the post workout window? You think it's a myth? You think that has some merit, but it's just overrated? Like. No, I think it has merit. I, I believe in it. Um, I'll have a, a scoop of Vitargo, which is a carb drink. I'll have that right after my workout, and I add uh, a scoop of whey protein powder with it, you know, in order to get those amino acids and, uh, and the glycogen right back into the muscle cells. I believe in it. I've been doing that for years. Okay. Okay. Let's talk. This is a very complex topic. It could be very complicated, but fat distribution, right? Uh-huh. So there's some people who believe that your fat distributes like and at the same muscle groups every time you gain weight you know okay so let's say for example like roughly speaking you know uh 50 percent of it goes to like you know your 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 your, your torso then 25 percent goes to like your 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 arms the other 25 goes to like you know your legs and neck or something like that like okay what's your thoughts on body fat distribution on, on fat distribution do you think it always goes to the same places or you think like, you know, you gain 10 pounds, you know, last year and then the 10 pounds you gain this year, it'll go to like different places. Um, I think it's, it's pretty distributed evenly. I mean, I think guys will get it more in their stomach and their lower back, but, uh, I don't, I don't think like if you eat more one year, it's going to go in more places. I, I, I never really heard of that. I think it's, it's pretty much distributed all over your body, you know? But it's going to go to those same places every time, like genetic-wise, because that's yeah, where your genetics yeah. are made up, I guess? Yeah, I think your genetics pretty much determine that, yeah. And then, you know, as you, as you get older, it's just easier to get fat because your metabolism changes. So uh, you have to be more careful of, you know, gaining too much weight as you get older. Okay. It's different when you're younger and you're in your 20s and your metabolism is much faster. Okay. Okay, what's your thoughts on people saying... Uh, Smaller meals. They eat smaller meals throughout the day because they want it, it stretches out their their stomach less. It's like if you eat like three huge meals, they're saying how like expands your stomach and like stuff like that. Is this a myth? Is yep. it like a load of crap or? I think the uh, the more frequent meals is just more important <clears throat> for uh, nutrient absorption. I think it's easier to absorb the nutrients and you know when you eat smaller meals every three hours than just eating a bigger meal. I think when you eat a bigger meal and the longer you go in between meals, the lower your blood sugar level gets in between meals. And then when you eat again, a lot of those calories are stored as fat. So I think it's just easier to keep your blood sugar level more stable when you're eating uh, more often, six meals or even seven meals a day, every two and a half to every three hours. I think it helps keep your metabolism faster and it keeps your blood sugar more stable and 
I think it's just better for nutrient absorption also. Okay. Now, when it when it comes to carbs, like for people who are like overweight, right? I know mm -hmm. a lot of like a lot of like heavier women or even men like um, who are trying to lose weight. There's these people online saying how like no carbs after six or no carbs after a given time. What's your thoughts on this? Like, I, I don't believe that. I think it's just more um, the the overall amount of carbs and calories and everything that you're taking in per day. Um, I've dieted for competitions and gotten ripped eating carbs right before bed, you know, so I don't think it matters at all. Um, as long as the carbs are mostly complex carbs and you're not eating an overabundance of them and you're not raising your insulin level too high, I don't think they'll be absorbed as fat. I think the overall thing that really counts is how many calories you're taking in per day and how many carbs you're taking in per day. So I, I, think, uh, I, I think that's kind of a myth. I don't believe in that. Because you think it's irrelevant. Here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay no, I, I agree with that. I think it's like, I don't think it matters as much as people think, you know? Right, right. It's kind of like the whole like uh, split, full body, upper, lower type thing. It's like, I don't feel like it really matters what kind of program you're running. I think it's like total weekly volume. Yeah. It's like the same yeah. idea. It's like, okay, so this, is right. last, this is the last question. It's a little big, but then we'll wrap it up. And okay. For all the viewers watching, uh, if you guys have been watching the whole time, we really appreciate it. You know, hope you guys are getting a lot out of it. I know I'm getting a lot out of it. But um, when it comes to drug-free lifters and supplements, right, mm -hmm. what do you feel like are the top three supplements that are, like, bang for your buck for, for like, size, you know, for, for muscle, like? And, uh, and, the, and the mistakes that people tend to make with them, like, just, like, you know. That's a good question. I'm not really taking a lot of supplements right now. I think just, you know, a good protein powder is good, a good uh, carbohydrate powder. Like like I said, I take that Vitargo before and after a workout. I think that makes a difference because it's a quick-acting carb. It gets in your system. Um, and then I also take uh, essential fatty acids. You know, I'll take uh, flaxseed oil uh, on days I don't eat, like uh, salmon or a high-fatty fish. I'll take essential fatty acids because I think those omega-3 fats are very important. And they also help with uh, insulin sensitivity also. So they help, you know, uh, create more insulin sensitivity on your muscle cells so they can absorb the uh, uh, carbohydrates easier. So I would say those three pretty much. Okay. Okay, so that pretty much wraps it up. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, all right, John, I really appreciate you for, for being on today's episode. And, um, okay. Thank I you. put all the contacts in the description link below, Instagram, site, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You have anything else to say? or? Uh, if anybody's in the podcast, I have the Bodybuilding Legends podcast on iTunes. I do that every week. So if you guys want to check that out, you want to learn about the history of bodybuilding and learn from some of the old school guys, um, you can check that out. And my website is bodybuildinglegendsshow.com. And I also do diets and training. Uh, for It's on dadbodtoripbod.com. So if anybody out there has got a dad bod and they want to change it, uh, they can do that. Uh, but I, I can design tr uh, training and diet programs for anybody. It doesn't have to be someone who's older with a dad, dad bod. bod. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Perfect, John. I appreciate it. Uh, stay right, in man. touch. And thanks a lot for yeah. the knowledge. Yeah. Send, send that to me when it's all done. Yeah. It'll be posted this week. So... <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay. All right. Sounds All right. good, buddy. All right. Nice Thanks a lot, bro. Take care. Take care.